Hi everyone, welcome. We're going to keep going with degradation mechanisms, this time with one which is fairly pervasive in structural applications, fracture. We've only really touched on the topic, but we already know the type of fracture that one obtains in a uniaxial tensile test, and that's where we're going to start. We know that some materials do not have much ductility at all, and can fail in a brittle manner. This is largely observed by a stress-strain curve that looks like this. The more notable feature is that it doesn't fail gradually. It fails very suddenly with no warning. This is typical for materials which do not have any ductility. Comparatively, materials which are ductile will fail completely differently. It will demonstrate some features and warning signs prior to failure. The appearance of a neck after some peak stress occurs, and then the final fracture occurs at this neck location. There is clearly a difference between these two different material types, but more importantly, there are significant differences between how the final fracture takes place. Furthermore, there is a significant difference between the toughness, which is demonstrated by the area under each of the curves. If you recall, the area underneath the stress-strain curve is energy. Upon fracturing, this strain energy needs to go somewhere. Some energy is converted to heat and noise, but the majority of it actually goes to creating a new surface. This is why the surface area for a fractured ductile material is much larger than those that fail in a brittle manner. However, this type of behavior can change if there's already a defect or flaw which exists. That failure surface has already started. This needs to be considered, and this is what this lecture is meant to cover, the fracture toughness. The depiction on the left demonstrates the sequence of fracture for most materials that do not contain a flaw. As we already know, most metallic materials will have some ductility, and this is how they will fail. We've also looked at how stress can concentrate around flaws. For example, a localized set of slip planes, as shown in the lecture on fatigue. In this part of the lecture, we're going to talk about how to quantify how much stress can build up in the presence of a flaw. Let's look at a stress concentrating feature. We can consider an external flaw, that is, one that occurs at a free edge, having a length a and a tip radius of rho. From a geometric perspective, an internal flaw, that is, one that is enclosed internally in the material, can be considered as two external openings into each other, such that the midplane would otherwise be a free edge. You can consider a flaw open to the environment on a free surface as being one crack, having a tip radius of rho, causing one stress concentration, and an internal one as being two cracks, each with a tip radius of rho and therefore causing two stress concentrations. Let's get on to what these stress concentrations look like for an internal flaw. Starting with the same type of abstraction of lines of constant force making up a stress running across the length of the material, it would look like this. By placing a flaw in the center of this region, the lines would have to bend and bow around it, whereby there would be lines closer together immediate to where the flaw is. Now reverting to what the stress looks like on a plane that bisects the flaw, it would look like this. Far away from the flaw, the stress would be equal to the far field stress, that is the overall stress being applied to the region. Moving in closer to the flaw, the stress would increase to some maximum and then drop to zero across the flaw as there is no material to carry it. If we were to change the aspect ratio of the flaw from being circular to elliptical, where the major axis is captured by 2a and the minor, 2b, then the maximum stress that is obtained is much higher than for a circular flaw. This is because there is now an effective tip radius of the flaw, which causes higher stress concentration at each corner. If we were to plot what the stress profile along the x-axis would look like on the line that bisects the flaw along the y-axis, we would schematically end up with something that looks like this. The stress increases from the far field stress to some maximum, to undefined as there's no material to carry it over a length of 2a, and then from this maximum back down to the far field stress, and is therefore symmetric about the middle of the flaw on the x-axis. 
The magnitude of the stress concentration, K, is a function of the aspect ratio of the flaw as captured by A and B, such that rho, the tip radius, is B squared over A. This concept of a stress concentration is not limited by length scale. It is valid for any component where there's a stress concentrator. Think about where a shaft is stepped down, or a keyway, or any other mechanical feature. This is why most components which have these features typically will have a fillet or chamfer to diminish the stress concentration at this location. It's also useful for providing the basis of what a crack looks like. If rho is made extremely small, However, the concept of a stress concentration for a crack loses its relevance. What we need is a capture of a stress gradient surrounding the crack tip. Cracks have finite dimensions, and we need to work back to where finite stresses act on them. To illustrate my point further, plotting the stress profile for the right half of the flaw shown on the left, it can be observed that as B approaches zero, which describes an extremely sharp crack, then the maximum stress will approach infinity. More tangibly, a crack is defined as a flaw which has an extremely small tip radius, and the result of the crack tip is an extremely high stress. So what kind of things can give rise to this type of behavior? What can be considered a flaw? Briefly, all faults that can manifest in a metallic system can behave as a flaw, and they occur at very different length scales. Note that what is being described here is not exhaustive, but some of the more prominent facets are given along with their rough length scales. Some of the atomistic length scale features, dislocations, vacancies, etc., do not act as cracks, but instead they are consolidated in a specific region a few trillion times then they can act collectively as a weaker region in the material, or a flaw. Inclusions and in large precipitates can do the same. Macroscopic cracks can occur by fatigue. Cleavage can occur due to environmental exposure and internal stresses. The list goes on and on. The main point being made here is that there is a menagerie of things in metallic systems that can act as cracks and therefore the onus is on determining whether or not they will affect the viability of the structure or component that they comprise. It is not just the size of the crack, but also the loading of them as well. If we consider a structural component that has an embedded flaw, then there are different ways in which it can see external loading. Moving from left to right, if there is no force to open the flaw, or if it's loaded in compression, then it will stay closed. If the flaw can open as previously described, if it sees tensile stress acting directly, then it will open. Loaded in shear, either along or out of plane, then it will also evolve, getting longer. Looking at the immediate region on one half of our internal flaws, these are discrete loading modes. Mode 1 is opening, while 2 and 3 are shear modes. These modes are often represented by Roman numerals, such that I, or the capital letter I, is mode 1. In-plane loading affects the flaw differently than the anti-plane shearing, where the flaw gets longer by material shearing directly about the flaw in mode 2, versus what is better described as tearing in mode 3. These are the main loading modes for cracks. The specifics for mode 2 and 3 are out of scope for this course. We're only going to focus on mode 1 which serves to open the crack directly. This is the worst case, as the other two are often complicated by the additional resistance to opening, such as friction and other forces. These will be covered in courses in later years. The basis for cracks opening is down to crack geometry, describing how sharp the crack is, and the opening mode, which within this course will be to open the crack underneath a far field tensile stress acting on it. Let's look a bit closer at what happens at the crack tip under these conditions. We know that as a crack tip becomes extremely small, then we start approaching infinite stress from a mathematical standpoint acting on the tip. That's not very useful, as it's a singularity. It isn't really conducive to a practical approach to addressing them. What is more useful is defining a boundary for where we get back to finite values.
glossing over approximately a century of deep thought by Griffith, Irwin, and others. A simplified version of how to deal with this is that the stress at a crack tip is inversely proportional to how far you are away from this tip, which is what I've plotted here. Looking along the line of symmetry as depicted, we can use a parameter to capture this effect, ki, which works to convert the proportionality with respect to the distance from the crack tip. Acting on this line, and only on this line, the stress is actually equal to ki over root 2 pi r. However, this is only true for this line. At any other orientation of the crack with respect to the driving stress, it will be proportional. We have therefore ended up with what we need to replace the stress concentration factor, which is undefined for cracks as opposed to other finite features. This is the stress intensity factor, which reflects the stress intensity due to the mode 1 opening of a crack. It is not the stress concentration factor, regardless of the use of K. We'll cover this in greater detail and get closer to an equality instead of proportionality in the second part of this lecture. So in this part of the lecture, we're able to review that some materials can fail in a ductile or brittle manner, and their toughness as assessed by standard uniaxial testing translates to the formation of new surfaces. We've looked at how a stress concentrating feature can be abstracted to provide the basis for a crack and the limited utility of doing so. The stresses at a very sharp stress concentrator are effectively infinite, which isn't really helpful when trying to assess what far field stresses will act on a crack with finite dimensions. While there are different loading modes of cracks, we're going to focus on mode 1, loading that serves to directly open cracks. In the second part, we'll cover the specific material property which decides the stress required to open a crack with a given length, and the caveats that accompany this property. Until next time.